Hallelujah. Amen and amen, brothers and sisters. We are grateful to Elohim for the privilege of this course on personal spiritual growth and maturity. It's a course for everyone. Nobody has ever arrived until we arrive at the pearly gates. Until then, there is room for growth. Even Paul the Apostle, the great vessel the Lord used, he said in Philippians 3 that he was still pressing on. And in 1 Corinthians 9, he said about, he spoke about running a race. You know, that those who run like uh, the games, like the Olympics, they take time to prepare. That he too puts himself under subjection. Lest by any means, after he has preached to others, he becomes a castaway. And so as we are talking about this very theme and topic, I want every one of you to open up ourselves. We all need to grow. We all need to grow. There are things I experienced in my life now that were not there some years ago. You know, certain grace I desired, I yearned for. You know, I yearned for. And by the grace of the Lord, because of that yearning, the Lord, it has pleased him to do it in my life. And I know that every one of us, we can grow into the fullness of the stature of Yeshua. That's the ultimate, to grow up into him in all things. And then he becomes our all in all, and he takes total control, total ownership of our being, and he uses our being to express himself by his spirit. When we get there, you know what? It's a sweet place to be. When you get the teaching note, you can read all the introductory remarks. Because we are truly at the end of the age. We are truly like never before. We have always been. The journey to eternity has always been slow and steady. But for the first time, things are coming to a head like never before. And if there's anything we need to do at this time, is to remember we're going to come before the judgment seat of Yeshua. We're going to have the options for our work to be evaluated of what quality it is. If there's anything we need to do now is to press into the fullness of the stature of Yeshua. If there's anything is to come to that place where we are no longer struggling as it were to enter. But we are now totally invested in coming to that place where the Lord has full ownership of our beings. And we now begin to look at the crowns that he has reserved for us which Paul was able to tell Timothy, I finished my race. The only thing left is the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me, not only to me, but to all those who love his appearance. Let's remember, the Lord himself has promised to uphold his own. And in Philippians 1, 6, he says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Yeshua. So the Lord undertakes responsibility. We're going to discuss a particular uh, uh, lesson on the means of spiritual growth, the instruments of spiritual growth. But it's something we need to know. The proof of life is growth. If there's life, there'll be growth. And as in the natural, so also in the spiritual. That's why we need to understand what Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. He therefore beloved. See, you know these things, beware, lest you also be led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both for now and forever. Amen. And brothers and sisters, on that note, I just want to give you an overview of five stage growth process we see in the Bible. If we know them, Let's keep them before us like the mirror of the world to show us where we need to grow as individuals. If you're a leader, a pastor, a congregation, a group of people, you can use this five-point framework to know what to do in the lives of the people. And so we want to recommend this. If you're part of this network anywhere in the world, please take this course seriously. Take it on board as some of the fundamentals. Just, just as the 16 glorious truths, just as the nine fundamental seas, take this one, personal spiritual growth and maturity also, as one of the fundamentals. Use it as a framework to know how the people are doing. So let's begin now. All right. The five-step growth process in the kingdom. Stage one, spiritual babyhood. 
This is what we discussed, part of it in the last lesson and the last two lessons, really. We hear the milk of the world is the means of substance. In other words, strong principles can be taken because the person is a babe, just like children. Children need milk. They can't eat solid food yet. They can't eat bones yet. They can't eat certain things yet. So you give them basically, and that's what we say in say, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the world that it may grow thereby. Father, we pray that by your spirit, you will help us to apprehend these five growth stages so that your name may be glorified in us in Yeshua's name. Amen. So to start the kingdom life here is normal. It's not abnormal in any way. The problem is to stay stuck here, you know, after many years with the Lord. And that's what will make somebody toxic, unable to be a true witness of Yeshua. And the consequence of not growing in grace have been described we talked about the telltale signs and all that, so we're not going to repeat them here. But just picture for a moment, somebody born again. After one year, two years, three years, four years, we still need to just give him milk. And what is milk? Word of encouragement. God will do this for you. God will do this. That's all. We don't teach them principles. They can't receive it. No. If you keep growing on milk, you will be stunted. You have stunted growth. That's what is called arrested babyhood syndrome. A lot of people just love it to be petted, to be petted, to be, you know, two sweet words and nice words and kind words, and they can't handle any situation. And it's a very dangerous place to be because the Lord has ordained that we should be able to handle things stronger and bigger. And the normal thing is people who are in babyhood syndrome, they tend to just become workers in the church. And before you know it, they are operating by their natural talents. And the natural talent, for instance, can be in acting, in singing, in decorating things, in making things. And they can become famous, they can be popular, they can become acceptable in the congregation. Yet inside, they are really babes. They've not grown beyond the, the, the emotional bubble that holds them. And that's where they are. And you know what? It is not a good place to be. Because the Lord is returning soon. The trumpet will sound. It's not a good place to be because death, nobody knows when death will come knocking. And so one ought to grow. The Lord needs a harvest from each of us. And if we abide in him and him in us, and if we allow him to do what he wants to do in us through the leaders he has appointed, there will be growth. Stage two, this is stage of discipleship. Those who count the cost. And make a commitment to follow Yeshua Jesus. Now, for those of you who have uh, um, first edition of this work, you can see that there's a difference here. The reason is that we start a program. You know what? When we come to another edition, the Lord shows us gaps in the understanding, shows us a more perfect way of presenting the truth. So there's a more perfect way of presenting the five stages of growth. And I want every teacher and everyone who is a student of Global School of Ministry or the master class, take note. So stage two is discipleship. This is a stage where we count the cost to respond to the invitation of Yeshua to come closer, to come to another level in our relationship with him, where it's not about what he gives to us, but about our opening our heart to embrace and enthrone him as king, as lord over our lives. Many believers relate with Elohim, I mean, relate with King Yeshua as Savior who saved them from sin. Very few relate with him as Lord, as the King who rules their life. And Yeshua said in Matthew 24, to, uh, uh, um, Matthew 16, therefore Yeshua told his disciples, if any man will come after me, he doesn't impose it on us. <laughs> the, the Lord doesn't control our responses to him. He should invitation. If any will come after me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. Brothers and sisters, he made an invitation. Follow him to where? Follow him to the cross. What happens at the cross? Death of self-nature, Galatians 2.20. And the Lord wants all of us to get there because discipleship is the state where we become followers of Yeshua. We enthrone him in our life. He rules our life. And when this is so, we have realized this, the depth of the Great Commission. 
The Great Commission is not gather crowd or milk drinking babes into stadium and pump some nice words to them and miracle, you know, do signs and wonder. No, you can do all that and all you produce are babes. The Great Commission is a teaching commission. Check the words of Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go and teach them a person at a time. A congregation at a time. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which signifies submission to Him. Publicly, baptize, signifies submission to Him, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I've commanded you, and Lord, will you always even to the end of the age? Brothers and sisters, it's a serious business. Why? The word of the Lord is what renews the mind. The word of the Lord is what transforms the heart. We need more disciples in the household of faith. We found many babes, many children. There is need for more disciples, people who allow the Lord to take over their lives. That's a need in the household of faith today. Now, stage three. Nine, good as it is to be a disciple of Yeshua, there's another stage called friendship with Yeshua. It's a stage of intimacy with him. Yeshua himself modeled it. You know, he used to, he was with his 12 disciples when they are, when he's going to a crusade, they go there, they will arrange the people, he, he prays, does a miracle, they distribute the food, they pick up the, the pieces and all that. Then when they are traveling back, he goes to sleep, you know, in the sheep and they are rowing. All those things they were serving, just like that, serving. But the day came, Yeshua looked at them and announced a transition in their life. John 15, verse 14 and 15. You are my friends. If you do whatsoever I commanded you, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things I have heard of my Father and made known unto you. So this is a state of intimacy with the Lord where we press in. We want to relate with him closely. Oh, we love the time we have to with him in prayer. We love the time we hear from him in his word. We love a time of communion in the spirit man. And we just love his presence. We want to be more like him. Intimacy with the Lord is a state of friendship. If you have a servant in your house, if you're traveling to, say, USA, you say, well, I'm going to USA tomorrow. That's servant. Now take care of this, that, that. And that's it. Supposing you have a friend. You're not going to communicate that way with a friend. You're going to tell the friend, you know, I'm, I've been traveling to the United States of America. I'm headed to Texas, you know, to a place called Kiogo, about two hours from Dallas, you know. Uh, they pick me up in Dallas and drive me. You give details. Why? You are friend. You are intimate. You are friend. So friendship speaks of intimacy, where the Lord gives us deep things about ourselves, deep things about our circumstances, deep things about what is committed to our trust. And again, we need more friends of Yeshua in the household of faith. It's a spiritual growth stage that comes about. The Lord himself invites us to that stage when he sees the yearning of a heart, like, you know, Psalm 42, as the deer panted after the water brooks. There's a way you pant after the Lord, pursuing him, seeking him, being satisfied with nothing more than him. You just want intimacy with him. That is where it takes you, friendship. There's another stage, which is sonship. Yeshua again modeled it. The same people he told in John 15, I no longer call you servants, and I call you friends. When he rose from the dead, and Mary Magdalene came to see him, and he encountered Mary Magdalene in John 20, verse 16, he said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and said unto her, Rabboni, she was startled, Rabbi, which is to say, Master. Yeshua said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. And say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. So Yeshua announced the possibility of a transition in our relationship to that of sons of Elohim, just like himself. My brethren, brothers and sisters, it's so important that we understand that this is a state that we all desire, we all should desire to get to where we are like sons of Elohim, just like Yeshua. In other words, if you read Hebrews 2 very well, from verse 9 to verse 15, 
you discover one secret that is in there in plain sight. What is it? The father gave Yeshua the ultimate son to the world so that through him, the earth tree will be repopulated with sons of Elohim, people who are mature, who now come to the place where they behave like Yeshua. They behave like Yeshua. What did, how did Yeshua behave? John 4, 34, Yeshua said to them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's his desire. My, his food is just to do the will of the Father and to fulfill it. John 5, 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I speak. I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. John 6, 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That becomes a burning desire just to do the will of the Father. That's what we live for. He says, go here, you go. Go there, you go there. You are not asking questions. You are not debating with the Father. Men and brethren, we need sons of God to arise in this generation. They make a difference. The pastor doesn't need to try to pet them, try to make them happy because they are not in church for the pastor. They are in church because the Father by his spirit, planted them there to be part of a congregation to demonstrate the body of Yeshua, the bride of Yeshua. And so when you have sons of Elohim as co-laborers, you can go to sleep like Yeshua on the boat because you don't need to bother. They take their responses seriously. Everybody takes the response the Lord has assigned and the work of the Lord is going organically. There's no need to try to make anybody happy before he does anything. People take response for the responsibility of their own uh, father. Sonship is a place of responsibility. Sons speak with the enemy at the gate. Who will speak with Satan at the gate? The sons of Elohim. Who can wage spiritual warfare, bind the powers of darkness, resist Satan, and is not able to destroy God's work? Problem in the church today, there are a lot of members of churches who are disciples of pastor, who are the sons of the pastor. It's now a popular place. People are accumulating sonship. That's my son. That's my daughter. No, the Lord hasn't sent us to go and make our own sons. He sent us to go and be instruments of making disciples of Yeshua and sons of the Most High, not our own sons. It, it's something that if people understand these principles, so what has happened today? That's why there is no unity in the body. Why? Churches are busy. Pastors are busy making their own personal disciples and their own sons and daughters. So if you are making your own, the other pastor is making his own, there is no basis of unity. But if we point people to Yeshua, point people to Yeshua and get them to be grown up in him, then it is possible to have unity of the body on the bond of peace. And that's what we try to do in this network, that everyone is pointed to Yeshua, grow up into him in all things so that we can be a body of people across the world who are growing in sonship. Sonship is so vital, it's so necessary. It is the antidote to babyhood and to, you know, coming to that place of being carnal. No, sons are not carnal. They are spiritual people. They can handle pain. They can handle difficulty. They don't internalize it. They just give it over to the Lord and sonship. Is so necessary. Now, there's another level the Lord wants us to grow to, and that is to function as priests, royal priesthood, after the order of Melchizedek. Many people tend to forget Yeshua came to fulfill the ironic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. He came to fulfill it. And Yeshua told us in Matthew 20, 20 to 28, not to go the way of the Nimrodic and Nicolaitan priesthood of people who, who are big lords who dominate the people and step on them and use the people. No. He said, no, that's the way of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are for Nimrodic leadership. The Gentiles are for the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But for those of us who are his own, he said, we are called to serve. You see, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek is about serving the Lord and serving the saints and serving people based on two principles, royal priesthood. As we are told in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, he says in verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. You should show for the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of Elohim which had not obtained mercy, but I have obtained mercy, dearly beloved. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, 
abstain from fleshly laws which were against the soul. You see, the royal priesthood, they know we are strangers and pilgrims. This world is not our home. You know, even now, there are people loudly proclaiming on, on, on uh, social media that no, no, they are contradicting the word, gathering followers unto themselves because it sounds nice to teach occupy till I come in a negative sense, to teach Genesis 1, 26 to 29 in a negative sense that now we now have to possess everything, compete with the unbeliever. No, the Lord is teaching something profoundly. While you are here, don't go and fold your hand. While you are here, don't be lazy. While you are here, be diligent. The gift and calling of Elohim in our life need to be used to do kingdom business on his behalf. That's what that occupy means. Do kingdom business on my behalf. Represent me. Take charge of your environment. And by the grace of the Lord, you can manifest the Lord so much so that your home, your office, your business is, a king, is an embassy of the kingdom of Elohim. Men and brethren, listen to this. We are called to be the royal priesthood. Two things there, royal and priesthood. Royal speaks of kingship. Every believer has the capacity to use the authority of the name of Yeshua to cause things to happen, to cause change in the atmosphere, change the atmosphere by the authority in the name of Yeshua, by the, 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 the spirit of Elohim in us, by the uh, power of the blood of Yeshua, when it can clear the atmosphere of negative spirits and things that try to hinder the work of the Lord. We use the authority of the name of Yeshua. Kings rule by decree. We also ought to rule by decree that we, we declare things and they happen because we walk by faith, not by sight. So the Lord has called every Christian to have the authority to be a king in the domain the Lord has granted you to hold on his behalf. Then priests are those who stand between God and human beings. We are called to be priests. And part of it is reconcile sinners to the Father which is the ministry every believer has received, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21, reconcile sinners to the Lord as a lifestyle. You see, when you understand this good process, you go the right way. A lot of people are going the wrong way. They want to establish a church. God didn't tell them. They want to establish a ministry. God didn't tell them. God has called you with the grace to be a supportive minister. And that's where he will bring out his grace in you. You want to be a primary minister. And these are important things. People are not discussing. People are not. People don't want to stay in their role. The role the Lord has given to them, they just want to. They want a title. They want a position. They want to be seen. They want to be known. The Lord says it's not about being seen. It's about we pointing people to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's so important. There are very little things you can do in this regard. Those who, you know, in, the, in London, we don't sit on the altar, we sit behind the scenes to remind ourselves we are here to serve them. And on the mission field, some of people were shocked, those who they didn't know fully, and they want me to go to the altar and sit. I, I get them to say, no, I sit right in front like other brethren, because we want to remind ourselves that we are servants of the Lord. People want to carry the Bible, say, no, please don't worry. Some people get offended. You know, I remember a brother who left the network in Europe. What was his offense? He wanted me to go and sit on the high altar on a throne. There are two thrones there. One of, I said, brother, please don't worry. Let me sit here. This is, this is my consecration with the Lord. He got offended. He has not spoken to me for some years. You know what, brothers, sisters, all of us, you check what area that the Lord requires you to do things differently. You know, let me tell you before we close. Yesterday, something happened. I got a very beautiful message. Somebody sent me a message. I said, Shalom, Apostle George. I sat there listening to the classes over and over again. And I saw the areas that require growth in my life. It's amazing how the Lord continues to grow us when we are available to him. And I sent a message how full of joy that this message was received. I don't know about you. What are you receiving? How is this course touching you? Are you into it? This course is designed to prepare us. Some things are about to happen, brothers and sisters. Let's not make a mistake and just get into the wrong things. It's time to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Not as something we are going to rush into a few days. No, it's something that we can live in. 
by the choices we make. We're going to face situations, circumstances. People are going to do things to us, say things to us. How can we process it without bitterness, without offense? How can we just hand it over to the Lord? And we're not asking the Lord to deal with the people. No, we're actually praying for them. We're actually interceding for them because we look at their actions. It is just not right and proper and they need, don't need to stay in it. And these are things that all over the world Christians are missing. Christians are paying back people in kind. Christians are being vengeful, being judgmental. And in the process, Satan is fostering his culture upon the people of Elohim. By way of assignment, number one, can you share three things you learned from this very lesson today? Two, what are the five stages of growth outlined in this chapter? Can you just do it summarily in a short form? And three, what personal challenge did you receive? I told you about how somebody sent a message about how this thing has been profitable. What is your own personal challenge? If we really check where are you in these five growth spectrum, we're going to pray right now. And by the grace of the Lord, if the Lord permits this evening, we're going to have another lesson, lesson number four. And we can continue that way. I want to ask you, please, brothers and sisters, don't look at anybody to the left, to the right. Look at yourself. Take the mirror of the world. Look at yourself and say, what is in this for me as a person? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you because you are good. Your mercies endure forever. Lord, we pray that you help us not to be among the number who are busy trying to justify ourselves. But Lord, that in a cause like this, we are open to the operation of your word by your spirit to the intent that we will respond rightly and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. Father, have your way and do the work you have ordained to do in and through all of us to your own glory and praise. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching and we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook, Monday all the way to Sunday, every day by about 10.30 a.m. UK time. And that's the same at Nigerian time. And you, it's either Apostle George, Monday to, Friday, uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace, uh, Friday to Sunday, and then in the evening of Sunday, we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6, after 6, another one up to 7. So please join us on the live stream and you're going to enjoy it. We also visit our website, www.gsom.ac to download free ebooks. This course you just listened to, all these lessons, you know, there's an ebook we have free of charge. Everything we do is free. But more importantly, you can actually do your program on, you know, ebooks. You can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want. You can also, if you want to do the yes course or be, do the master class, you can go to www.kingdombooksclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it. You can also subscribe to our channels. This YouTube, gsom.tv and we also have a telegram channel gsom media you can send us an email at akclife.tv at gmail.com we love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of yeshua jesus is empowered with truth remember it is the teach train equip activate and release paradigm absolutely free of charge have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon.